What's up, internet world, and welcome back to the channel. Today, I bring you my 2002 Porsche 911 Turbo. So in this video, I talk about the front, I talk about the side, I talk about the back and the engine. I also talk about the interior, how great it is, as well as taking it for a drive and giving you guys my opinion. Oh man, this thing just handles like a dream. So let's take, for example, you're looking for a fast, cheap, reliable car. Yes, fast, cheap, reliable. Pick two because you'll never get a car that does all three. This is probably the closest car you can find on planet Earth that does almost all three. And even if the comments blow up with their cars that they believe is all three, they won't find one particular piece, and that is resale. So you may or may not know, I'm the type of guy that likes to have lots of different businesses, lots of things moving and shaking, and part of that is trying to hunt down deals. And you know, trying to find a deal in the car market is very, very difficult, because resale to me is important. I'd rather have a car that holds value and still does almost all three items, and yes, this is it. But here, this is not an Elon pump and dump scheme, and this is definitely not a Doug DeMauro, let's keep the prices down and not inflate them video, because you know, Doug already did that. For me, it's about showing you guys how much I love this car and the different types of things that made me attracted to it. So this is called a 996 body style. You see, in 1998, this was introduced. Not this, because it's the turbo. Turbos were introduced in 2001, but 996 was a big deal for Porsche because two big things happened. The first thing is that this is now water-cooled. You see, 911s were called the 993, and those were air-cooled. But the second biggest thing about this 996 are these headlights. There's a lot of talk about these pancake-looking headline things, and there's a couple things. One is, yes, it was a big change for Porsche, and they thought they'd just change it up from the typical beetle-looking brown headlights. And yeah, that was great. That was a great idea. It worked and all that stuff, but here's the biggest mistake they made. They put these headlights on a Boxster, and at the time, the Boxster was like this little thing that like dudes that bought 911s at the time would buy them for their wives, or because there's a small little tiny convertible things, and Hey, at the time they weren't as manly as the 911, so it got a lot of slack. You can't put these headlights on the same car that's sort of a lower model and priced to be their cheapest Porsche. That was a big mistake. So that's kind of the main story about this, but here's the crazy part. They dropped these headlights the next model over in the 997, and that's disappointing because they should have just stuck with it. If they didn't launch it in their Boxster, I believe this headlight would still work because these headlights are from the GT1. And that car at the time was sweet. But history repeats itself, and I kid you not, check these shoes out. These shoes were hot in 1988. And yes, they're making a comeback right here in 2021. And as far as history repeating itself when it comes to this car, if you haven't watched our video from last week, Go watch it. We reviewed the 2021 BMW M3, and in that car, they did exactly the same that this car did back in 2001. They pushed out the gate with these headlights. And yes, BMW's pushing out the gate with that grill. Will they make the mistake and drop it in something that's not as lucrative as this thing? I don't know, because this car had air-cooled, water-cooled. The BMW has all-wheel drive, first time ever, and the grill, so the grill is like, uh, nasty. The headlights are like, uh, nasty. Let's find out what the future holds. 
So if you didn't get all that, it basically means that Porsche took the chance on making this headlight, screwed up, put on the wrong car, everybody hated it, and then they ditched the headlight because this thing only lasted for like five years. Let's see if BMW does that. Will they keep the grill for the next generation or just leave it for one generation when everybody hates on it? We'll find out. Now back to the car. So this is a stock 911 turbo. There is absolutely no modifications done to this car from the engine to the headlights. Everything is 100% stock. Now, this has a Xenon headlight upgrade, and that's why you have this headlight washer. A lot of people wanna know what this silver piece is. Well, this pops up and shoots water at the headlight to clean it. Now, there's no wipers like the older Volvos or anything. This is just simply on water pressure. Now, if you look at the headlight itself, this is the fog light. The Xenon right there that comes through is this little projector. Underneath is the high beams and daytime running lights. As far as the front bumper goes, this is probably my least favorite part of the car. This sort of looks like Sally Carrera from Cars. It's got three inlets. It does have three radiators underneath it, one on each side and then the center. But the cool part about it is they actually did this plastic piece because yes, this is an everyday driver and this really gets beat up and scraped. I'm glad that it is this sort of hard plastic. It does have these little vents in here to create some downforce underneath the car. But other than that, that's the front bumper. All right, so let's go and check underneath the frunk. Now, here's the annoying part with Porsche, and it's the same way as the new 2021 that we reviewed a couple of months ago. If the battery dies, you can't get to the battery without getting under the frunk. And the only way to get under the frunk is by popping a fuse panel, boosting it at the fuse panel, only to open the frunk, not to actually start the car. Once you do that, then you gotta come back out here, and then you can get to the battery. So you gotta get two things to start your Porsche in case it dies. Well, this is manual, so I guess you could push start it. You know, 10 buddies behind you pushing it, putting first gear, letting go of the clutch, and then it starts. And like all our other reviews, we measure out how much trunk space we have. And here we have about 27 long, about 16 wide, and just about 15 inches high or deep. Now, this is made of aluminum, but the front of the car is probably not the best part, in my opinion, of the car. It's the side, and here's why. So this is the best part of the car, the side and back. These hips are nice and wide. I love these inlets. The back is almost as good, but this part is the best. You can see it when you're driving in the rear mirrors. Now you can only get this wide body on a C4S, the turbo and the GT2 at the time. The other crazy part about this back end rear hips is that this car is all wheel drive. So you have a staggered setup of wheels. You have wider in the back and skinnier in the front. And speaking of the staggered setup, in the back we've got 295, they're so wide. And the front's got 225, which is basically the same width as a, a general Honda Accord. But the crazy part about it is not just the width, it's the height. You see in the back you actually have 30 series tires, in the front you have 40 series tires. Now, you may not know what that even means, but in most cars, yes, it's fine to have sort of a skinny, or sorry, not as high of a tire in the front when you have a staggered setup. The difference being is that this is actually a taller rim and tire than the backs and that has to do with the center mechanical viscous coupling differential i'll get into that a little bit more but if we talk about the wheels and the brakes this specific car is a turbo so it just has regular brakes if you get the x50 which is the model above this that has ceramics so even those cars of 2001 this has a feature that cars today have that people are still in awe about it's like the smallest little thing but because this is a coupe when i open this window the window actually drops now, that feature can cost a lot of money if it breaks. Thank God this thing is still in good shape and it hasn't broke yet. But a lot of people always ask, like, will this break? Will this window smash or will it get stuck in the winter? I don't know, but hopefully this doesn't piss you off. Never close the door with a window. So before I jump to the back or engine of the car, there's four things I wanna talk about. First things first I wanna talk about is the gas. Now, to put fuel in the car, it's on the front of the car. It's not on the back because, well, there's no space for it in the back because the engine's there. You see, if you didn't know, Porsches have engines in the back, 911s. So on the front here, it's basically the old school style. You got to turn to click. When you click it, it goes. And they did put the minimum fuel rating is 93. 93 is probably impossible to get. In Canada, most of us put 91 in our cars because that's what most gas stations carry. Number two is the fact that this does not have a moonroof. It actually just has a sunroof. There's no glass. It's paint colored like the car. Thirdly, it does have these sort of roof rails that you can slide in here, old school European style. This is from a Volkswagen Bug. And last but not least is what's underneath 
the suspension. It's an all aluminum suspension, which was the first for Porsche back in 2001. The other thing it does have is it does, as I mentioned, have the viscous coupling center differential, but it also has a rear limited slip differential. Anyways, all that mechanical stuff I'll talk about on the drive. Let's go take a look at my, almost my favorite part or second tied with first, I guess, the back. So if you forgot about why you're watching this video, it's because of savings. You see, you can put your money in the markets, you can put your money in crypto, real estate, all kinds of fun stuff. But for me, I like fun, I like cars. Yes, I invest in all that stuff, but part of me wants to enjoy where I put my money. So I bought this car for $42,000. A lot of you guys wanna know. Today, it's probably worth about 60 to 65, somewhere in between there. Yes, cars have gone up in price. Five years from now, you would never think if you put $40,000 in your pocket or $42,000 in your pocket, Five years from now, that pocket can be worth 65 grand. And we're not even five years in yet. I've only had this car for one year. Now back to the aesthetics of the car. When I looked at this car first, I thought it actually opened up like a fastback or a hatchback. You must be thinking, are you out of your mind? It never did. But if you look at the car, you would think that it actually opens up this way, except it doesn't. Aesthetically, other features are exhaust tips. If you look at this exhaust tip, it is actually circular on both sides and it has a sort of Audi sort of look. Hmm. Now, the 2001 models actually were fully circular, 2000, 2001 models. 2002, they changed with this design and I prefer it so much more because you can tell what model it is. It looks more modern, just a cooler look. Now, when I see cars out there, I always notice that guys put their exhaust or they put aftermarket exhaust that stick out, but this is the perfect amount of sticking out in terms of exhaust. If you don't know what these things are, these things are bumper guards. You see, instead of putting a big, huge, clunky bumper, they added these two guys to add the rear impact test. It was for like the safety standards of impacts, I guess. But this really is the meat and potatoes. The fact that this says turbo to me is where the money's at. It's sort of like that Mercedes-Benz emblem people used to rock back in the 80s. This is a turbo emblem that I love. Some other aesthetics to note is this rear bumper. These slits are reminiscent of a 959 Porsche, which if you looked at on Google, it's the most rounded looking Porsche you could have bought at the time. It was also super expensive. Now, this spoiler is speed activated. It goes up at 75 miles an hour or about 120 kilometers. This specific one is broken, it doesn't work. It pops on my dash, it says activate, miss something, it doesn't work. It does have a rear wiper, which I've never used. And other than that, let's go to the meat and potatoes and that's the engine. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Let's pop the engine. It is pretty hefty, but all the way up. That is all you see in this 911. And even though this is 20 years old, these prop rods still work. They don't just fall down like every other car when they're five years old. This is the meat and potatoes of this 911 turbo, a 3.6 liter twin turbo, a first for Porsche, I might add, and it makes 414 horsepower and 413 foot-pounds of torque. You see, you can also get an X50 version, which is like their modified version of the time. Uh, it's kind of like a Turbo S of today's world. And that makes 444 horsepower and 457 foot-pounds of torque. If you want to watch a review on that, Doug Demore obviously made one. This is the base normal turbo. It does has a top speed of 304 kilometers an hour or about 190 miles per hour. Sick. First ever twin turbo by Porsche. A twin turbo, flat six, 3.6 liter, and I cannot wait for you guys to hear it. So Mike, I wanna buy a 911, a 996 911, but I cannot find one. All I can find in my area is a C4S, should I buy it? Because everywhere I've read, the Metzer 911 turbo is the most bulletproof engine you can buy. So should I buy a C4S? You see, the C4S had something different. It had something called an IMS bearing issue, which essentially means yeah, your motor can blow up. But it only happened in 5% of them, but it had so much of a wave behind that issue that the prices really dropped. So if you looked at a turbo, it's about twice the cost as a C4S. So if you're looking at a 996, is that the same sort of model if you bought the C4S compared to the turbo? And the answer is unfortunately, no. The C4S is not gonna go up in price, even though it is wide body, has the same shell. It just doesn't have this bulletproof motor. There's enough of a stigma that the fact that this is bulletproof with dry sump, then the C4S. So if it was me, I would hold off, search the country and buy yourself a turbo. Speaking of that, let's jump in and take this thing for a whip. Let's go. All right, so yeah, totally got carried away. I have to talk about the interior. And this is where they saved money. There's a lot of plastic, just a lot of like rattly stuff. It doesn't really rattle. It more like creaks and cracks when you drive it. And it's just very plasticky. Now, there are some really nice bits, which were 
options like the carbon on the shifter that says turbo the only place that says turbo in the car it's got nice carbon handbrake that's the two nicest pieces in this car everything else besides the steering wheel and the badge because the badge looks sweet is very like plasticky even though they did add some like leather at the top here the leather on the, the door sill here with some stitched mess eh, kind of nice and then of course you had the biggest option which is a suede roof it's all suede that's nice and thing but everything else other than that is very like cheap like look at these visors just very cheap plain looking it just feels very cheap the signals very clunky not quality not german not the stuff we're kind of used to now this looks like it's an after the fact piece this is where the cd holders go and they just kind of pop out and you pop this down you pop the cds in anyways this can be actually replaced you can pop this whole thing out and you can put a compartment in there so you can have kind of dual compartment but i can see through the dash and this little add-on there's a big huge gap in between which makes me feel like it's like an afterthought piece um, the buttons just very kind of cheapy for some reason but they've actually improvised a few things there's not a lot of storage space in here yes there is this little small center console uh, i'll get to that in a second but on the door card here they actually have sort of this little slider that comes up and this is a really cool space this is probably the most genius part that i like about the storage you can sort of pop this open shove stuff in between close it down and now i have an armrest so um, it's ergonomically very good but that's my opinion for in terms of cheapness in the interior now let's get into some of the, the pieces of the usability of it so let's talk about the center console this does have a key so you must be wondering why is there a key right in the center console and that is because this is the same center console that's in the convertible or the cabrio so that way if the top is up this is not obviously a convertible but the top is up you can lock it and that's why you have it here a lot of guys ask why is that there so that's the reason that's there um, other than that i feel very centered in the car so if that makes any sense driving here i drove here in my ram and i can tell you that the steering wheel is sort of off kilter they try to make it more spacey uh, this is 100 percent driver oriented so i'm dead center in the middle i'm one with the car everything is perfect as i turn my head i just feel very controlled and you know solid sitting in this car one of the biggest complaints at the time were these seats you see these seats look very flat and they do appear very flat at the front and most people just look at seats in the front they don't want to look at it in the center and you can the way you look at it is that the seats sort of flare out and in the side here it does bolster very wide but the crazy part about it is the body width you see this is very short or not wide essentially and i can't flare these seats out i can't flare this back it's not powered there's no button here that flares the back out so as i sit here i can already feel these side bolsters kind of push into the back of my lats here so anybody wider than me which is a lot of people um will find that these things are really pushing in your back so that's probably the one complaint about these specific seats not really that it's flat but more so that these bolsters kind of push you in already for anybody wider than me so that's something to keep in mind you may not know this or not, but Porsches actually have the key ignition on the left side, which sounds like, yeah, I already know this. I've watched a hundred reviews on Porsches. I already know that it's on the left side. And that is because in the race time, when Porsches are racing, the fastest way to start the car and jump in, you see drivers that actually start races outside of the car. So they were given the key and they had to jump in the car and start. That way it was fair. You're not just ready to accelerate. You're actually standing outside your car. You had to jump in and start the car and take off. So that's why Porsche put the ignition on the left side. It's the only car manufacturer out there that's on the left side. I'm talking like generalized manufacturers that sell cars to the masses, not specific designed cars. Um, but the other cool part about this is the mix of materials only on the door panel. They've put carpet on the door panel here. That I do like. There's a really small light on the inside of the door card here facing where the key goes. That is because at night, if you don't know where the key is, you have this really small light that points in that direction. Actually, if you look at most new German cars now, they actually have those same lights hiding in the top here. They're usually red and they face down in this area. They're not really to start the car. They're really to know it, to put it in gear. It's kind of a weird one why they have it there. This makes sense. The newer stuff pointing down in red makes no sense. Other interesting pieces is the cup holder. You see, Germans at the time would not put cup holders in their German versions, but in their North American versions, you kind of got this. One for the small cup and one for the larger cup. And this is a really good, really, really good cup holder. You see, when you put cups or, or bottles in here, it doesn't shake around like some of the older Audis. This one does a great job. As you can see, it's got different positions of where the cup should go. Other buttons on dash here was PSM off. And basically, 
poor stability management is always on until you push the button to shut it off. That's pretty typical in German product. It's always on until you push the button to shut it off. Now this is one of the first vehicles to have PSM. And what it really did was it's such an early entrance, it would actually let the car slide. And I'm gonna show you guys that on the drive. The car actually handles very well with it because you can actually let it fishtail a bit without totally killing yourself. Other buttons here is to set the spoiler up or down. Um, also to put the rear wiper on. It, the rear wiper is actually a button here and not on the stocks on the left or right like most cars today. And then on the right side, the button here is to lock and unlock the doors and then your rear defrost. Underneath that is just a blank button. Again, this is a North American version. I don't know what that button is. In Europe, it's probably something important like launch control. As far as design in the electronics goes, I'll talk about the first and the best thing about this car that is not the same on any new Porsche. And that is the fact you can actually see all five dials. If you look at the design of this center display here, it's not really a display, but the analog gauges, it does have some digital on the bottom. It tells you the speed you're driving and then how many kilometers you can do with my fuel you have, the time, all that stuff is digital up there, but it's more like dot matrix. But everything else is analog, which is so kind of weird because it looks to be so modern in today's age compared to when this was made 20 years ago. But what is not modern is the climate control. This thing is archaic. It's so archaic that it says manuel in terms of the speed. Now, the 2003 versions actually said manual. It actually fixed the English. This way, they only had one way to say it, and that was manuel. And I could talk about the radio, but the radio completely sucks. The speakers are actually good. They're made by Bose. They're pretty decent. It's got decent bass, but the radio itself is terrible. It's so bad that I actually use this. This is crazy, but this is what I use for my sound system. I don't use a sound system in here. I Bluetooth audio this thing and I pound it. So one of the main reasons I sold the Audi R8 is because of this. The fact that this has back seats is the reason I kept this car and not sold it and made the money. And that is because when you have a family, you can't take a two-seater car everywhere you go, but you can drive this. This is a versatile, all-wheel drive, everyday driver. Now, it is tight back here, so for me sitting up, I can't. I can't sit up, I gotta sit sideways. So if this is a short trip somewhere, I could, theoretically, somebody my size could sit back here. But anybody under 10 years old or, you know, five foot three could sit back here and still sort of manage it. But some, some cool engineering pieces here. One, if you look, this is very, very high because the center drive shaft goes right here and obviously the engine's back there. But the cool part here is the Bose sound system, even though I never use it, actually has the outlets when I put these seats down back here. Now, the reason Porsche built these little thing is so you can put golf clubs. And look how they have a stopper here. They've got stoppers. So if you're putting luggage back here, which you can, you can fit it, it actually stops. It doesn't fall into the cabin. Check these out. Pretty awesome. But four seats help. If you don't have four seats, you can't take the family. All right, guys, so I'm my 2002 911 twin turbo, and let's take this thing for a rip. I just love the way Porsche has the center RPM gauge right directly in front of you. Um, as far as visibility goes, super easy. There's, this is a fairly small car. 911s are fairly small cars, but it's pretty much all glass. Everywhere I look, there's glass. There's basically no blind spots. This is like a no blind spot type of car. Um, this is a six-speed manual transmission. The one thing I do notice though with this specific one, I'm not sure if that's on all of them, um, is these brakes aren't the best. They're good, but I feel like they should be grabbier and stronger for whatever reason. Anyways, like most manual transmission cars, first gear is always too short. A decent amount, but it's a little bit too short. Second gear is really when the party happens. The steering on these cars are so good. So good. It is a little bit softer than obviously the newer stuff. The newer stuff, you can just change the adaptive suspension to tighten up or loosen it up. This is sort of in the middle. I find that this thing is like soft. You go over the bumps. Oh, there's a 911. Silver. They all, I feel like they're all silver. They're either silver or black or like crazy colors. This car's just so visceral. It just feels so engaged. But I want to get on the throttle and show you guys or make you guys listen that the exhaust note isn't very loud and the engine makes noise, but it's not, it's like a balance of exhaust and engine. It doesn't really, one doesn't overtake the other. Great gearing. I know he's make a left here and slide this thing. Just great chassis on the throttle. The back end comes out a bit. Just 
great little car. So a lot of guys, when they grab 911s, the first thing they do is put an exhaust. There goes my failure spoiler control. Remember I was telling you guys that the spoiler doesn't actually work. It just tells me it doesn't work. It's there, but it doesn't work. Uh, but a lot of things, a lot of guys, what they will do, they will put an exhaust on this thing because the exhaust just livens it up and it opens it up and you can't really hear it. Like I can hear it make noise, but it's so like quiet. It's just like pushed down quiet. Listen. <laughs> so good. Not a lot of turbo lag. This is not like a Subaru where it has like nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden, this is like when I hit the throttle, it's like on and it just gives this push. And yes, it is turbocharged. You will feel the purity of that turbo. Totally different than the R8. The R8's naturally aspirated, long gears. You go through the power band and it just gets better, 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 better. This thing's like a constant push and it's just like a freight train. <sighs> so good. The fact this is 20 years old and you can hammer on this thing all day is magical. And that's why Porsche sells a ton of these things. Even though the interior is very basic, it's just so engaging. It handles great, very soft. I wouldn't say it's a total daily driver because the, the, the racket this dash makes when it jumps and it hits bumps is kind of annoying a little bit. But so I want to talk to you about the viscous coupling. The center differential is always on based on the front wheels. You see, the front wheels are a little bit taller than the back wheels, as I mentioned. So it always has a little bit of pressure applied to the front wheels. Now, when the back slips, the front wheels notice the difference in speed and it basically clamps down the center differential, which puts more power to the front. So that's how it's designed. And because, as I mentioned, this PSM is the first generation, this thing is not up to date with today's version. So it does allow more slippage. It's not perfect, but it does allow you to slip more than normal. Now, I leave it on all the time. I don't really notice it. It does kind of come into play at some times, but on the throttle, this thing is just awesome. <laughs> now, I understand where Porsche did this. This is a whole new breakthrough. All-wheel drive, twin turbo. They try to soften it up. They try to soften the looks. They try to make the seats a little bit softer than the old generation. That's exactly what they did here. So it's softer, milder than the old generation, but still a lot more raw than the new generation. And yes, you save money. Yes, you get that same feeling. Actually, you get a better feeling if this is a second or third car. If it's the first car, yeah, first gear is a bit short. It is raggedy and it does make all kinds of crunching sounds. You hear it? So you get all those noises, but it still draws looks. Nobody's ever looked at this car and said, man, that's ugly. They've actually flipped the script. This thing actually does get a lot of looks and it's gonna go up because they stopped making these whack headlights. And price point, think about it. A brand new M3 today is about 100K. This is about 50. But at some point in the next three to six years, they will overlap. This will catch up to the price of a new M3. So what would you rather have, a new M3 or this thing? For me, I plan to keep it as stock as possible just to enjoy it the way it is in its purest form. On the brakes, on the throttle here. It's awesome, man. On the brakes. On the throat. Oh, oh. oh man, this thing just handles like a dream. <laughs> oh, and even this crinkly little signal works for me. On the brakes, on the throttle here, a bit of bounciness. And on the throttle, second gear. Just got so, so smooth. Anyways, I hope you guys like this review on this 911 Turbo. Turn the tunes up. Go search the country for your 911 and comment below when you find one. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit the notification button. Off you go.